a very warm welcome on behalf of Shri Vaishnav Vidyapeet Vishi Vidyalai Indore, India, who has clubbed all of us for this webinar series. I, Rupali Bhatia, welcome our eminent speaker, Professor Sebastian Mijil, Professor and Vice Dean KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Shri Vaishnav Vidyapeet Vishi Vidyalai and President Isaga. 2021 to 22, Dr. Upindal Dhar, Coordinator of Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, Dr. Jigyasu Dubey, Dr. Vinod Damrikar, sir, all other invited guests, eminent panel members, participants, and dear students. International Simulation and Gaming Association, ESAGA, is a global community of professionals engaged in the design, development, application, and research of gaming simulations. The university organized 52nd annual conference of ESAGA 2021 in the month of September this year, preceded by a webinar series as precursor to the ESAGA 2021. The university has established the Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, COESG, to promote simulation and gamification as pedagogy and undertake research in this upcoming multidisciplinary area of research. Today is the very first webinar in this series, Pratiti Becoming Aware, organized by COESG. Topic of the webinar is understanding where to go, gaming as a method to innovate between organizations and systems. And the resource person to deliver the webinar is Professor Sebastian Major. First of all, I would like to request Dr. Upendra Dhar, Vice Chancellor of Sri Vaishnavidya Peet Vishividale and President ESAGA 2021 for the welcome at this. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon from India to all of all of you, all those who have joined. Although we are from different countries. Timing should be different. At Sebas's place, it is morning. In India, it is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So timings may be different, but uh, uh, I'm very happy to greet you on this special occasion. This is the first uh, webinar after we had uh, ISAGA 2021. And in the valedictory session of ISAGA 2021, we had announced that in our university, we are starting this center of excellence in mission and gaming. And under this banner, uh, this is the first um, webinar that we are organizing today. And um, like last year, we thought that the right person to start the series is Professor Sebastian Major. So this is why we are uh, repeating the experiment. And we are very uh, much thankful to um, Sevas for uh, accepting our request uh, for this particular webinar. Intention is to remain involved. Uh, to, uh, this ISAGA 2021 was not the end. That was a new beginning. So we have to keep on going and keep on learning from each other. Because what we felt is that the, uh, the webinars that we had last year, were very um, useful. Many um, things we learned during those webinars. So let the uh, series go on. Therefore, uh, we have taken the decision of uh, starting this series again and learn from each other. And uh, as all of you know that uh, ISAGA uh, 2022 will be held in United States. It has all been decided. And uh, hopefully by that time, uh, uh, things will be better. So far as the coronavirus is concerned, hopefully we may be able to uh, meet physically uh, in, during the ISAGA 2022. However, in the meantime, during this series of webinars also we'll be meeting and learning from each other. So I would like to once again, Welcome, uh, Sebastian, for this webinar, and also all those, Irina, I can see Irina is there, and all those who have joined this webinar. I'm sure that with every passing webinar, we will have more and more people joining us and refreshing our memories 
so that we remain in our in touch and keep on learning. See, as today we talk about lifelong learning, so that that lifelong learning has to go on. There is no end to it, irrespective of the age, irrespective of the experience. So once again, welcome, and I'm sure that it will again be a learning experience for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your positive thoughts and warm welcome. So before starting the session, I would like to introduce our speaker of the webinar, Professor Sebastian Major. Professor Sebastian Major is full professor of healthcare logistic at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. He is specialized in simulation, gaming, and other participatory methods to capture real world complexity in innovation processes. His interests are in theory of design of complex adaptive systems and the backbone of society. Working mostly on healthcare, health prevention and promotion systems, but equally interested in other large scale questions. Professor Major is currently serving as head of the department for biomedical engineering and health systems MTH and Vice Dean for the School of Engineering Sciences in Chemistry, Biotechnology and Health, CBH. Once again, I welcome sir and hand over the session to Professor Sebastian Major. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, um, all of you, first of all, for the invitation. It's really, really a pleasure uh, to be able to do this. I feel a little bit like a rock star with so many people in the audience. I'm used to being somewhere in a small room on the side of a conference uh, with this type of topic. So thank you so much for uh, doing this. I've prepared a little, um, also because you've seen me uh, a few times now, I've prepared uh, something else where I try to go into why do we actually do um, uh, gaming? Uh, particularly when it comes to innovation, as that is also a huge topic uh, at your university. Um, and well, I, I think we have some nice overlap here. So I would like to share my slides to start with. When I do this, you should see them in full screen. Um, and I would like to start with a little movie. Uh, we once did a project that was a little bit uh, more sponsored from a product development uh, point of view. And I believe that that movie explains the concept rather nicely. Here we go. City planning in our days, as all of you know, isn't happening at the drawing table anymore. Instead, high class 3D software is applied. Some are even. Well, as you can see, some are really realistic. But there's one problem with this. Many projects demand the collaboration of very different stakeholders. Different simulations are made of public transport, pedestrians, city environments, and so on. And usually it becomes very hard to bring all of this together in one consistent simulation. Therefore, ProtoWorld has designed a unique approach. It allows you to combine multi-model simulations using a game engine to develop a game scenario. Let's dive into this university campus. Students are about to leave for the afternoon to take the bus or metro. Now let's add some traffic. And now, with one click, we will create a more realistic scenario. The bus is late. What about 15 minutes? So, as in real life, our students decide to pass the additional time in the library or whatever students might do in their spare time. What is important here, different programs work together to simulate what really happens. And if you look at the dashboard behind, the administration is very intuitive as well and can be adjusted to many different scenarios in real time and faster. If you are professional in city planning or events organizing, with this new platform, planning becomes as easy as a game because that's what it is from now on. So, um, 
Of course, this was a little bit on the commercial side. We were paid for doing that. Um, but the, the thought behind it is, is pretty simple. Um, and that is, we want to develop games in which we de mimic the behavior of some real world system. But the problem of the, of the real world is that it often exists out of many different components uh, and has a lot of different uh, decision makers and, and experts involved who do not really speak each other's language. Um, many domains already have so sophisticated simulation models, but how these talk to each other is very difficult. And here in this project, we used gaming technology um, to create well, an, an interactive platform by which it is possible for the human decision makers uh, to, to take care of those parts for which real, uh, let's say, a bit more advanced decision making is important. Whereas we use the, the computerized simulation models for those parts for which we have good representations of, of mass behavior or technical behavior already. Um, this is on the relatively high tech side of gaming, um, but the same concepts hold true, even if you would do a paper based tabletop type of simulation. Um, what is important here is that we represent different parts of the system in a way that human decision makers can understand. And why is this important at this particular moment? Well, um, I really like this cartoon. Um, Houston, we have a problem. Um, there are huge amounts of crises coming towards uh, humanity. Um, and well, we all have our eyes on the first wave, uh, but there are a few waves behind it, uh, probably. So if we want to counter any of this or, or want to be ready to be able to, to deal with it, we need to be able to make connections between systems. And those connections we then need to describe. And this is my theoretical basis, um, where I particularly distinguish um, uh, social technical systems theory, which is then the inner circle here, where we have technical components that talk to each other. We have agents, humans, talking to each other. Uh, and we have agents interacting with components. Social technical systems theory assumes that there is something to optimize, that we can have an optimal performance of the system based upon the technological capabilities and, and, and the human performance of control. This is why aircraft rarely fall out of the sky. This is why nuclear reactors are relatively safe, um, because all of those are treated as relatively close systems for which uh, the human control component is extremely well uh, developed, protocolized, etc. However, when it comes to the larger backbones of society, they behave more like complex adaptive systems with their emergent behavior. Because suddenly our humans, our agents, are no longer rational decision makers. They also have political plays, they have relationships, they have dynamic relations, therefore they change behavior given circumstances. Um, so to me, social technical systems could be a part of a larger complex adaptive systems uh, view, um, but they are not the same. And it's important to make distinctions between uh, when are we talking about complexity and when are we talking about social technical systems. And then this slide, like, there are two sides of this complexity. There's technical physical complexity and, and there our engineering skills. I always work at relatively technical universities. So we lecture in simulations, in models, in, in finding the best solution. But there is also the other side, uh, the sociopolitical complexity, where knowledge is negotiated. And, and that was something that I always had to explain before the COVID pandemic. But if you just look at the amount of what, what, from a very rational point of view, could be called fake news, but what is reality, at least perceives reality to a lot of people about vaccines and, and uh, whether the disease exists at all, um, 
then you see that this is this is not nonsense but it also happens at um well let's say the regular policy uh, uh, making types of cycles so what i see in in um the systems engineering world is that uh, we need to discuss the difference between aspect systems and subsystems. To me, aspect systems are like maps that we can lay over each other in um, um, describing how society works. So you could have an energy layer and you could have people that are transportation experts and there are people that know everything about the population and information systems and buildings, etc. These are the traditional areas in which we educate people um, because you can be an expert in buildings. You're rarely an expert in transportation and information systems and buildings at the same time. The problem is that for everyday life, it doesn't matter that, or well, it does matter that we have access to all these aspect systems, that we have services from them, but it is the combination of them that makes uh, whether our life can function or not. We could have the best um, uh, information systems and transport infrastructure, but if there's no energy in the area, well, <laughs> then you have a problem. Or if, if there's no healthcare or um, uh, whatever, then you could have the finest uh, built city, uh, but it's still unlivable. So you need to think about the scale and the, the uh, types of pockets that you make, the type of this intersection between all of these maps um, to start talking about subsystems. And that's difficult. But if you really take complex adaptive systems thinking serious, as most people do, at least on paper, then you need to start thinking not just about how does this particular technical system function here, but you need to think about the entire life of people, not just their professional life or going to school, but how does the life puzzle of every day in, uh, fit together for everybody in society. And optimization, it's, it's relatively pointless. We would be happy if we could make something that works uh, for all of us. If you then start thinking about change, then you cannot just change within the system. Of course, you can, you can change the, the frequency of the metros, but the frequency of the metros is just one aspect. What you want to change, for instance, is uh, environmental, uh, environment, environmentally friendly uh, behavior. Um, and what we see, for instance, is that people that use uh, public transport a lot during the week to travel from home to work. Um, here in Sweden, we see that those people use the car a lot on the weekend to do the social activities uh, because they haven't used the car uh, uh, by then uh, because during the week they are environmentally friendly. So the, you need to, to think about the whole and the parts at the same time, and that is not easy. So where does gaming come in? Um, we need to be able to make the connections between all the different methodologies and, and methods that we have. And for me, this becomes like a three layered um, uh, uh, thing where you have a structured observations layer. Uh, uh, these days, machine learning, artificial intelligence, but also regular statistical modeling, uh, causal mapping, um, trying to get a model, descriptive model, uh, about what happened in the past, uh, because we can't observe what happens in the future yet. On top of that, we then have a level where we try to describe the system dynamics um, that we could do with people, participatory. We could also do it with computers, of course. But we still miss something. And that is the level of human insights, the things that are not modelable because we don't, for instance, have mass behavior of it. How would you, for instance, describe the behavior of a politician or of a traffic controller? Um, is that something that you can describe with a computer? Well, to a certain extent, if you have mass data, 
but to a certain extent not, because these people often react given a particular context, and their their behavior is dynamic and and, and complex rather than um, uh, social technical. Um, and therefore, we need this participatory layer on top where we have gaming decision theaters, so th these types of methods. But scientifically, this this is challenging because you need to think of systems of systems. There's human expertise that comes in where since the 1980s, we've tried to become more and more well, objective, you could say. There is a clash between analytical science and design science. Analytical science based upon on natural sciences. Can we describe the laws of nature, how things work, as if that is an external thing to observe? Whereas the design science um, is much more relevant for society because everything that we study, we first created ourselves. There's no natural phenomenon in there. Um, the, the, the value of labs reduces because you need to look at reality if you want to really understand what is out there. Um, but then what we've been looking for in science in general, we've been the Nobel Prizes, our little local hobby over here in <laughs> Stockholm, um, but for the Peace Prize because uh, Nobel invented dynamite, so the Peace Prize went to Norway. Um, but the, the, the contextual the contextuality of our findings becomes a limitation to the universal applicability of theories. It will be very difficult to make a universal theory about how cities work if I study how, what the dynamics of Delhi or Indore are. You could even question whether Indore and, and uh, Delhi would have the same theory about how this, the, the, the city works even though I'm convinced that you could describe the buses or the water system with the same theory. It also is challenging to, to systems development, to innovation, because your, your technology readiness levels, they will be mixed and you need to start testing early uh, and involve people that really know how, how it works. So we, we have a tendency to ask experts with doctor's titles and um, uh, high positions, etc. But you need to look at people uh, who really do the work. I do a lot in healthcare, and nurses are far better um, uh, uh, sources of information than the management of a um, healthcare department. And an important system, uh, 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 challenge here is that the size of the clusters that we sh should start to look at. Uh, and that we should try to, to find solutions for, they need to be sufficiently large because you can't have a universal uh, 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 a theory for every person in society. Um, but they also need to be sufficiently small because otherwise you're just back to your generalized models about, okay, this, these are mega cities over 10 million and they all behave like this over the entire world. Uh, so how, how, do we do, how do we make these clusters? Another uh, framework that I would like to present is uh, uh, Russ, who presented the differences between a programmatic framework towards change and a participatory framework. And he listed these uh, six different dimensions where no project really is programmatic. Well, maybe a few, yeah. Um, and no, are, none are fully participatory. But we often have to think about like, okay, where do we want our change, our innovations to score? Do we want to get these insights? Do we, or do we get into a process with each other? Um, and this is something where gaming moves everything towards the participatory side, but not all gaming is equally participatory because for instance, the, the, the proto world env uh, environment that we gave, we as researchers prepare that. It's not that that um, uh, we ask people like, what should we build for you? No, this is already a ready-made component and we, we develop um, uh, scenarios then for, for different cases. So you get to design 
And this is uh, the definition of Ezraham Subramanian, a dear colleague working at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, and NIST in the US. Um, he, he lists that designing is a, a cognitive and social activity. So it is about thinking and about talking with each other. Um, and it's also never finished because we get to like temporary solutions. Uh, but it keeps evolving. It, it keeps um, uh, developing the social system, who are included, it, the language, yeah, how do we talk about it and what information is there in a particular social context. The question then becomes, how do we shape this context? Um, and here, even in philosophy of science, we see the pluralism and, and dialogical devices, yeah, things that can get people to talk with each other deeply are um, uh, extremely important and well uh, this, this book particularly the black book models as mediators uh, by mary morgan and uh, margaret morrison uh, highly recommended as as reading you will never think <laughs> similarly about uh, uh, your simulations again so what could this look like and um, again right now i, I work in healthcare um but earlier i worked a lot in um, transportation so let me show you a few examples of, of practical applications of, of this thinking um in the netherlands where i'm from uh, so i'm not swedish uh, for those of you who didn't get that yet uh, but in the netherlands um, the railways are owned by a, a national uh, state operated uh, railway infrastructure manager called ProRail. Um, but there are commercial companies driving the trains on the, on the tracks, uh, even though 85% or so, uh, the vast majority of those trains is driven by the former state uh, uh, train company uh, called NS. Um, they wanted to get to a higher frequency timetable uh, and higher frequency would then act really be like a a big step um this is the netherlands yeah <laughs> compared to india it is tiny um but there are relatively many people living there uh, 70 million at the moment uh, this is amsterdam um, and i am originally from the east apeldoorn here I lived for a while in utrecht and then worked a lot in delft over here um, what they wanted originally was to double the capacity on the tracks by 2020 and to have 50 percent increase in uh, uh, 2012 on a regional basis and regional would then be here the west of the of the netherlands and then the the railway system would be transformed a little bit more uh, towards a, a net metro system where there's always a train leaving in a few minutes. But to do that in the old way, they had to double the tracks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that money was simply not available. Only about 10% of that budget for, for doubling the entire system was available. And they still said like, okay, let's try, let's do it. However, railway operations, um, we sometimes make the joke that they're as flexible as the um, metal um, rails that they <laughs> that they drive over um, it is very top down so you design something very often computer simulations and then when you say like okay this is the, this is a good design then you push it to the operations uh, and the question becomes does it work well very often not um, because the system in practice is already under pressure um, and you see that all those assumptions that the engineering and the computer simulations have about the operations, they, they no longer work. And the quote, the, the difference between theory and practice only exists in practice, it's, it's very, very true. Now, what we also saw is that railway, rail traffic uh, operators, they are not people that you could have like a very philosophical discussion with about their work. They are very practical. Uh, but they know exactly what they're doing. So what we had to do is to involve them to get the language, to get the discussion going. 
And that looks like this. You'll see a much younger me uh, here. This is an analog tabletop simulation. Uh, those yellow scour sponges here, they're trains, and there are all kinds of representations of information uh, visualized on those trains. And they were pushed in the simulation room, uh, validated with a, a computer simulation in the background. Um, but these are real train traffic controllers who try to emulate, uh, simulate a real, uh, a couple of hours of real uh, 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 railway traffic. There are several control rooms. These here, you see that they have a top view of the simulation and they give instructions. Uh, this person uh, with the green blue blouse is the, the voice that you hear in the railway station instructing passengers to go somewhere. Um, you can see from the body language how involved these people are. Um, they're really concentrated, trying to control their entire system with all the information they have about it. This is the national control room and here they were puzzling like, okay, how am I going to do this? Um, this is a simulation, a much younger version of me again. <laughs> um, this person that you see here, he is a train driver. Um, uh, and he was there to determine when personnel would take a coffee break. Uh, because taking coffee breaks is part of the safety culture. Like, okay, I need a coffee break now. Yeah, I've had my delays. And one of the things that we knew was that they actually lose a little bit track of where their personnel is. Um, so here he says in Dutch, so I'll tell you like, okay, then I go for a coffee. This is the type of simulations that we did in a very analog way, looking at new types of logistics. Uh, and then, well, you see the puzzle that was going on at the national level. And here he says like, this is one of the best traffic controllers of the Netherlands at the national level. And he says, it doesn't feel good. I just don't have control. So what is it that we did here? Well, we re represented the system, but you need to think about how do you, how do you represent it? So you can use icons uh, for relevant elements. Uh, these are all representations of trains but they are very different representations. They mean something differently. This is a very serious depiction, iconic uh, depiction. If you have this one, then they, so here nobody questions whether this is a train. If you have this one, they would actually say, no, our trains are yellow. You will never get that comment here. If you give them this train, they will start saying like, ah, okay, so we don't, do not need to pay attention to that or they feel invited to do strange things with their train because this is a toy train. But it's all train. So how we simulate, how we visualize does something with the way we talk about it. And that then brings me, I see that the design of the slides is a little bit off, but anyway, this brings me to four different, I'll do it here, take this one, it's the same. Uh, four applications of, of gaming. And here you could say in a two by two that who is the one uh, benefiting from uh, the game? Is it the player or is it the principal who ordered the game? And are we talking about a closed world in which everything within the simulation is already known? Or are we talking about an open world? And an open world simulation means that the participants can add things that the designers haven't thought of. So, of course, here in a closed world and where the player benefits, we're talking about learning. If you're talking about the principle um, in a closed world, then we're talking about the game as a quasi experiment. We can test something, um, uh, whether something works particularly on the learning side, but also on the quasi-experimental side in, in psychological assessment, for instance, there, there is a lot of theory, a lot of papers available showing how to do it, what improves learning, what improves the quasi-experimental side. Most of my research is here at the bottom, 
And that is then how do we use the games as, as uh, policy interventions, so to really change the innovation process, as well as how do we use it for actual design? So can we design something within a game that is then transferred to the real world? Um, and for this, you use the players as a component eh, in this hierarchical layering of methods. You use them to bring unformalized complexity, those parts for which you cannot build a computer simulation. As simple as that. On the right hand side, you want the players to bring their own role and own behavior. Uh, they should not play something fictitious. They should play something that they that they know and that they know better than anybody else, because that is what you want to study. So a lot of these systems are very large scale, very complex. There are many different um, uh, components involved, many different uh, aspect systems or, or even uh, subsystems next to each other. So how do we get some grip on steering through this? Well, um, from complex to manageable, so to say, is if you can reason with models and stakeholders. We have evidence that reasoning with models, building on the work of Morgan and, and, and uh, uh, this, this book, Models as Mediators, that it really helps to, to bring out um, the new theories and it makes everything less, less complex. Of course, we can also work with real, more with real-time dashboards, like giving people the feeling of how their point system works. Yeah, to a certain extent, that is a gamification of the real world. We need to monitor like, like feedback loops, um, which is something in which, let's say, the, the, the traditional um, uh, governance cycles are not so good because the follow-up is very often very slow. So how do you know that something is going wrong? Well, there, for instance, you would need your, your dashboards. But what is also important is that you need to bridge abstraction levels. You cannot just say we are the strategic level. You need to know how the operational level works to be able to do strategic work and vice versa. This is an example of uh, a game uh, that we built. These are Swedish words, but these are locations. Uh, there are small locations within uh, Stockholm. These are times of the day, morning, afternoon, uh, late, uh, late afternoon, evening. Uh, and here we've been experimenting with like, okay, can we make people play with where patients should go? And this is a very simple interactive uh, simulation. Um, where we have patients getting to healthcare centers and the question is so how do we deal with the, the transport between all those hospitals and healthcare uh, centers based upon um, uh, the ambulance capacity and here you see this is done in, in uh, board central is a healthcare center um, but you see the time distributions of the uh, people waiting you see utilization of ambulance and playing with a simulation like this that is built upon real data, real healthcare system with real people playing delivers a lot of knowledge about how this system could work. Um, but then the question becomes, is this a policy intervention uh, or is this design? Can we use the design from this simulation, from this game uh, and can we implement that directly uh, in the real world? Can I do the, the patient allocation according to this? Then you get into questions of validity. Um, another transport system, um, um, and this builds upon the proto world example that I started the lecture with. Um, in Rome, uh, Rome is uh, the home of the Pope, the Vatican City, uh, Italy. Uh, in Rome, traffic is rather uh, difficult, lots of people there, and suddenly the Pope decided on a jubilee year while we were in a project where we used this proto-world. Um, and what happened then was that we got the question, how can we deal with the 40 million extra 
uh, people visiting Rome that we expect in the public transport system. So we modeled this system with different options. Um, uh, so we could, for instance, communicate about delays. We could communicate uh, about alternative routes. And we had a fairly sophisticated, a sophisticated um, uh, multi-agent simulation that would respond to um, uh, those decisions. So what you see here, those things, they're people and they have fairly well validated social uh, behavior uh, rules behind them showing where they would go um, and when and how they would enter the Vatican. This has been used uh, sharply uh, to manage uh, the, the Jubilee year in 2018, 17, 18. No, one of those two in uh, in uh, in Italy in uh, in Rome. Last example um, in the previous webinar, I spoke about the mental health challenge, but here uh, we're now really working also on on the well-being definition of the World Health Organization uh, towards health. So not thinking just about uh, health care as a way of, of dealing with people who are in crisis and are struggling but to think about a whole population approach to mental health. Can, will we be able to uh, think through multiple aspect systems, multiple subsystems? Will we then be able to, to uh, shift the, the mean of the mental health in the population to the right? That will benefit the people in crisis, but will particularly benefit everybody in, in society. Similar questions, because you need to shift your focus from treatment and the individual to context, family, community, uh, whole systems change. Uh, so this is something that, that is known that needs to happen. But how? Again, we made a simulation. This simulation was made uh, in a participatory way. Um, uh, so we had, I believe it was 70 different uh, stakeholders involved in this process of trying to define, okay, here we have well-being. What influences well-being? What does well-being influence? And how does this all work together? And I won't go into the details of this um, schematic, but um, my colleagues then identified like which parts belong to which system. Well, this is the social system. This is the physical environment. This is the family system. Uh, this is really working at the individual level. Uh, here we're talking about education, government, healthcare system. And what it very clearly shows is that mental health is not just a problem of healthcare. It is a problem of what, uh, an issue of all these systems, even though healthcare has a very central role when it goes wrong. Um, well, we published some, some work on this as well. Um, if you like, uh, we often use Kumu. Uh, my colleague, Jayant Ragotama, um, he uh, created this diagram. And it's, uh, it's available. This is the latest version in, in this link. Uh, so you're very welcome to, uh, to visit and, and play with it. Um, and now what we do is that we make, um, for instance, this is the, the smaller city of Nortelia. And here you're looking at uh, some directors of different departments where we then position ourselves in 2025 and then try to make the case backwards using the system dynamics model on what they would need to do from all of their different departments to change their own data from where we are today to uh, uh, where they want to be in 2025. So it's a combination of backcasting, game, and this, this multi-sectorial approach. Of course, because I work at the technical university, what we now try to do is to estimate the strength of all of these links and to use uh, technologies like PageRank um, and, and some other uh, ranking simulations to look into like, okay, what are the what are the feedback loops? Can we give feedback on, uh, to people about where they should look or what uh, they should do with their policies? And then we can create games around that. 
again. My last slide. Um, making people from practice play a game, operators, it's, it's not trivial. Um, as I showed with the different types of representations of trains, uh, you're always into like, what is this level of detail that we want? Um, do we need to simulate an entire city? What can we actually uh, simulate? And um, there will always be differences between reality and what can be represented in the simulation. But if you get it right, then suddenly people are willing to, to share their expertise, what they know. And then we can really can get to these, let's say, layering of different methods to overcome the gaps between uh, all kinds of different uh, of different domains. So, gaming it is a proven method, uh, particularly in complex systems. Um, there is research from different corners of the world. Um, uh, on how this could work, but the exact mechanics of like use this and this game for this and this design or or innovation trajectory, that is still the subject of, of ongoing research. And that this is where I see a lot of activities within the ISAGA network, uh, for instance. Uh, I showed you some ex examples of transport, of smart cities, of, of healthcare. These are also the areas where you see the most happening. Um, However, the topic of sustainability uh, integrated, yeah, so not just CO2, but, but also the social, economic, and, and cultural aspects of it, um, those are very clearly on the agenda now. So thank you so much. Um, um, if you want to get in contact, feel free. Uh, this is the email address, most likely most relevant. Uh, this Proto World software we, we published also on GitHub. Uh, you're very welcome to use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I request panel members to please ask questions if they have, and I request participants to write their questions in question and answer tab so that we can ask. Sir, can you, can you tell something about the algorithms you are using? Absolutely. Um, be, because the, the funny thing is that we often say we're not, we are not the algorithm specialist. So we ask representatives of particular domains to themselves select the algorithms. And when we, for instance, worked with, with the transport uh, uh, problems, one of the first questions I got from uh, traffic engineers was, was what is the, the uh, traffic light uh, algorithm that you use because apparently I didn't know <laughs> uh, apparently that is a major topic and which one you choose so what we do now is that we try to identify what are those questions uh, what are those different algorithms that that could be um, uh, relevant and then we give the participants the option to choose the, the one that they like uh, the most which is a challenge because we should not choose uh, the particular algorithm, but at the same time, in the way you make your simulations, you need to be able to deal with a, a larger range of algorithms, which is not easy because not all algorithms are implemented in all types of simulations. Uh, so this path dependency is a, is a very difficult one. Uh, sir, actually, I beg to disagree that all the traffic problems invariably is over is applied, operational research. And also system dynamics very critically can be applied. So it is not a very difficult issue. Who knows the technical things? Well, the, the, even, though, even though you might be right there, there uh, the problem will be that my participants will not agree to it. Uh, and the participants are the key ingredients to be able to do gaming. Um, and this is where the modesty of the modeler from my side comes in. The, the the less i know about the topic but the more about how uh, i know about how to do these simulations the better it has it has become over the years sir how much is the ai component uh, is applied in all these games yeah uh, artificial intelligence yeah that, that depends um in on the traffic side we used 
uh, quite a lot. Now on the latest, I haven't shown you, but uh, we recently got access to the entire production data set from the Karolinska hospital, uh, hospitals here in Stockholm, which are very large uh, hospitals with good data. So there we try to train our models entirely based upon AI machine learning. Um, in areas where we don't have this access, then we use simple statistical uh, approaches. Okay. Navarji, please. Is there any Hi. other question? Yeah, sorry, could I ask a quick question? Hi, Sebastian, thank you so much. The really uh, interesting, insightful presentation. So, so my, my question sort of comes back to the validity of the models uh, in, in particular, as the first point, is how do we establish that? But secondly, and perhaps what I've seen is we reinvent the wheel every time, you know? So for example, when you create a mental health model that you, as you had in slide 32, is there any work, are you seeing any work to establish reference architectures for particular types of models in systems dynamics, for example, say mental health models? So these are all the things that need to be in the mental health model, which will then define the data that you need to get. And we know that we can build the authenticity in as opposed to creating it every time and then validating it and then we throw it away. Is, is, is there work happening in that space, Sebastian? The, the, thank you. Uh, this is a really interesting question. Um, I see that we're part of a movement uh, and that movement is um, taking away some of the, let's say, uh, high science, very specialized, uh, funding that always goes to the groups that that have an even better model for a small thing, so to say. And there there is money going now since since two three years to these reference architectures, knowledge bases, etc. But it's spot wise, um, and it's also going back also to the previous question uh, about what is then the best. Well, the best is very often difficult to know because it depends on who participates. Is, are these reference architectures or reference models acceptable? If you just look at the, at the health informatics area, you already have huge fights between SNOMED and OpenEHR uh, who don't like each other. Uh, different views on what, how the world should be, should be organized. So I do not believe that we will get to one unified accepted model but what i do see is that we get to a few of these larger aggregated bodies of, bodies of knowledge for which we can use the structures um, and that, that will be really beneficial for being able to use these models in in gaming we spend so much time on trying to get people who should know to to actually agree on something yeah that's right. And, and then that would extend into the machine learning context to provide a basis for it, for training those and providing a reference architecture for machine learning aspects too, right? Yeah. Now, thanks, thanks, Sebastian. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, thanks, Rupali. I'll hold off now. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, one more question? Yeah, yes, sir. We can sir. You know, sir, please. So you are on mute. Sir, please unmute. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Sebus, what is the value of using prototyping, at least at the beginning of designing uh, a system? Um, later on, you could build in, you could uh, go into research and uh, build in a lot of number work and all that. But at the initial stage, I think a prototype gives you a lot of uh, speed. Uh, in terms of understanding a system very quickly. Uh, what do you have to say to for this? Thanks, you know, uh, it's a very, um, the word prototype diminishes the value of sketching, um, where I see particularly analog games as a way of quickly being able to put a sketch of the system in place to get feedback. Yeah. Um, and this dynamic yeah. of being able to sketch very early on um, has, <laughs> now he walks away, uh, um, 
this process has very early on always proven to be extremely valuable um, because nobody knows everything. So the, the sooner you get the, uh, uh, the communication going, uh, the better it is. At the same time, I sometimes observe a risk with this, this prototyping or, or a little bit more open phase in the beginning. And that is that you um, always tend to say like, yeah, but we'll implement a better model later. Um, and there again, we need to have a modesty because sometimes we see models that are scientifically established, for instance, but do not cover the essence of the problem that we're talking about, because the essence is the inter interaction between uh, different things. Um, if, that, if there's one big problem that I always need to fight in projects is that um, real world experts believe in their own models. So sometimes staying at this more prototyping phase where we are not so explicit about the exact algorithms and the exact implementations, um, sometimes that's exactly what we need to do and we do not need to even go to deeper um, levels of, of uh, operations. But I wanted to show you the span. And for me, that's the trajectory that you, that you go through with each other. Yes. Prototype uh, commits you to a certain uh, beginning, and therefore it is a model. And yeah. uh, we heard it in the um, webinar series. Mm. At least three people spoke about and stated that, uh, quoted somebody, I forgot his name today, I think Box, or somebody, uh, Charles Box, who was supposed to have said that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I guess I must be the fourth person who's stating that. Uh, I found, uh, I mean, contrary to this, I found uh, prototyping for most systems, not games alone, for anything for that matter. Start with something small and then keep adding to it or cutting it down to size and then building it from there. So the prototype helped me make something uh, large, faster. And I could get to 90% of the intended uh, product but 10% would be because of my bias. And the bias is the prototype. Yeah. And uh, I agree. I also see two typed questions. Um, should I read them and, and try to answer them? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yes please. Um, yes. I see a question uh, in the future whether the gaming can, uh, gamers can get an opportunity in the defense department. And uh, actually, that is a, um, it is where most of this comes from, uh, because war games uh, have, are one of the oldest examples of gaming. And even a lot of the technologies of being able to couple simulations, for instance, come from military projects, particularly uh, US um, DARPA uh, types of, of uh, I see Yamaha, you have the Inkose logo. Uh, well, that community builds upon on these types of uh, backgrounds. So yes, gaming in the defense department is relatively big, uh, but expect a fairly sophisticated su simulation component to it. I see a second question that is that uh, uh, somebody has played city building games like City Skylines. Um, it, in our game is a bit different because we did not allow them to build the game. Uh, we were mostly in simulation mode. Uh, I've seen attempts to also be able to build games in these types of environments. What tends to happen, and it's actually the same thing that happens with us, is you get funding for a couple of years of projects and thereafter the, the software needs to survive and go, go further. Um, the most positive thing that I see happening is that we get, for instance, modules or, or components that spring off into the uni Unity um, game engine um, uh, environment. Uh, so that, that environment is getting richer and richer from the type of work that, that we uh, do as researchers. Um, okay, sir, I think we have covered all the questions. So, uh... Once again, 
Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable information regarding gaming and simulation. It will definitely help us in future. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Yasu Dubey, coordinator of Rupali, session. Rupali, just a Rupali. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Holdar has joined us first time. Okay. Uh, yes, Holdar, do you have any question? Yes, sir. Yes, Actually, sir, sir uh, I know you from that Professor Bhakar of, you know, that in MP attended his program on the case study writing from the yeah. with you and tracking you. And wonderful book you have written. Many of them I read it. And I request you to, sir, put attention on the book writing on the game also. You write a very easy way, very cozy way of writing. You like, I like your writing style. And also faculty development program on this game thing. Many of the components I know, like operation research and system dynamics, and also that you know finite element analysis, application, dynamic analysis in the offshore structure, all the things. So I see that from Professor Sebastian that many of the component I know and many other things I do not know, maybe the heuristic or other things. So faculty development program will help us. And also, sir, another, another my goal is that I recently come to know about the Watson Business School. They created a game on the startups simulation. I'm working on the startups. I encourage people to go for a startup. Don't waste, for, waste life like me. I wasted my life in the public sector. Got money, but useless. So they should create new technology, new things. And also the startup game is $199 costing in the Arthur Business School. We are trying to make it here in India, cheaper cost or maybe free. So faculty development program training will be very much useful. You know, I have a, I'm in a group and that group is led by one IIT professor, Dr. Apte, Prakash Apte. He is 75 years young man, kid, another kid. He's also very keen on this. So if you create the FDP, people will be gainer. And I myself has given my son for 10 lakh rupees for further exploration on the game and simulation for startups. Okay. Do you have any question? Any question for Sebas? Sir, question is you are doing wonderful things. And I have come to know about your ISAGA program very late. I couldn't attend the program, but I saw the material, especially Pratili with 360 page, wonderful. But sir, it's fast page. Index is not proper. Kindly uh, give little attention on that. Like links are not active, and also subject each lecture, 28 lectures are there, subject should be there. And who is there? Like Professor Sebastian lecture is there inside, I found it, but not in the Prozilib index. You know, we have to find out this, scan through the four hours YouTube link from there, you know, it's a very serious process. But Prozilib is that first page, second page rather, 28 lectures, indexing will be very, very useful to us. So immediately, you can go to the various professors and see. Okay, uh, Jigasu, you need to take care of it. Yes, sir. Sir, I, wrote, I yeah. wrote to him also, and I wrote to you also a long way, two weeks back, but probably did not have time to say, go through it. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, Rupali can go ahead. Thank you, sir, for your suggestion and guidance. Now, I would like to request Dr. Jigasu Dubey, Coordinator of Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, Sri Vaishnavi Vidyapidivishi Vidyalay, to propose words of thanks. Okay. First of all, my thanks to Dr. Sebastian Major for uh, giving us the time for this very first webinar of the series, Pratiti Becoming Aware. And uh, I know he's very much busy during these days. And uh, although he gave us the time and uh, today uh, in his webinar, he provides some frameworks on how this can be done and illustrates from a set of research and innovation projects from the past two decades. So again, thank you very much, Sebastian, and hope uh, we will be again uh, 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 meeting uh, other webinars also in future. And uh, I'm also thankful to Dr. Upinder Dhar, sir, to give me the, give me the opportunity uh, to uh, start this webinar and also their guidance for all this work that I've done. And uh, I'm also thankful to all the panel members, Dr. Dumblekar, Dr. Havaldar, uh, Alena, Jawarji, and all the participants to attending this webinar and make this successful. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to Rupali Ma'am also and uh, the university IT team also. Thank you. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebas. 
I would like to request all the participants to please give their feedback in the feedback form as mentioned in the chat box for getting e-certificates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sebas. Good Thanks to see everyone. you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sir, what is the next topic, sir? Next lecture, next month? So it is not finalized yet because uh, this time again uh, Christmas is coming. So as we uh, as this the topics and date will con uh, confirm, we will inform you. So so next 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 webinar will be sometime in the month of January. January. So topic and uh, resource person. This will be communicated very soon. Okay. Let us uh, exit now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod, sir. Thank you, everybody. Good to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you.